Okay. I'll tell you a little bit about our project. It's, uh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, as you know, it's Accessorized Reform Group, which the acronym is ARG, <laughs> um, which is the frustration that a lot of users express. Um, it's funded by the New York Community Trust, and the focus is to um, address prevalent problems with Accessorized. Uh, we do this by gathering stories. Um, stories from the users. We've done surveys, we've done phone calls to direct users. And through this, we can talk to key stakeholders like MPA and AAR and tell them what the post is on the community. Um, as Senator Kruger said, there are four organizations, Brooklyn Center for Independence, Sydney Arts, the Center for Independence of the Disabled New York, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, and Mobilization for Justice, which was formerly MFY Legal Services. So we would like to start by introducing some AAR users who will be sharing their stories. They are Valerie Joseph, she's the AAR community organizer for BCID. Erman, how do you pronounce it? Rimali. 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 Um, she's the AAR community organizer for NLP. And Monica, Monica Bartley, Sydney's community outreach organizer. Valerie will share her experience first, then she will be followed by Monica, ending with Iman. tours 
<laughs> that I wonder if anyone has ever thought about the psychological impact it has on travelers with disabilities. When I have an important appointment coming up, for example, I may be going to a press conference or some other work activity, or even a Monday morning, because my ride is always late on a Monday morning. I don't know why. But when I have such appointments, my anxiety level rises, and not just the day of travel from the day before. I am worried because I'm wondering if I'm going to make that appointment on time or if I'm going to miss the appointment. Then, of course, I am involved in various activities, like to have fun, and will take my accessory to go to a Broadway play. I may have had a fantastic evening, but when I have to wait two hours for my ride to pick me up, it becomes a nightmare. I forget everything about the fun I've had. And when, when I'm picked up two hours after and there's someone else traveling on the vehicle that they have to drop off before I get home, you can imagine how much more of a nightmare that is. And the impact of it is felt even days after. It, it leaves you feeling crushed. Now, I would like to see a system where we are able to travel and maintain our dignity. What I heard tonight sounds very encouraging, and I'm really hopeful that all of that will happen. Thank you very much. I'm not sure if I need the mic. I'm pretty loud. <laughs> if anybody can't hear me, just let me know. Um, so my name is Iman Ramali. I work at the New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. As you can see, I am showing off my nice legs above the baloney amputee, and I've been one for almost four years now. I've been using the accessory for eight years, though. Um, I can say that I am usually not on time for anything, which is awesome. I love it. Um, I am also a smart aleck, in case you haven't noticed. Um, and I use humor a lot because I get to know the drivers for a really long time. They tell me their life stories once and over again, even the, the, the other uh, passengers. I make a lot of friends on Accessoride because friendly and I talk to people. Um, one interesting ride I had recently, I was in Brooklyn meeting with a councilman, or my dog, in Coney Island. They took the one guy from Harlem all the way to Coney Island. And then we went all the way out to Valley Stream just to drop them off. Then picked up someone else near Valley Stream. And then I went all the way back up to Throgs Neck where I lived. I was on the excess ride vehicle so long that my phone died. So that was awesome. And I was on it for five hours. By the time I got home, I was supposed to, I put my trip way back in the evening so I could go out with my friends to karaoke because I love karaoke. And I wanted to get a drink and hang out. But I canceled it because I had had my fill of accessorized that day. And they were like, oh, what's your reason for canceling? And I'm like, ma'am, you can actually see that I just got home 10 minutes ago. So if y'all know where I am all the time, Google knows where I am all the time, everybody knows where I am all the time, <laughs> accessorized should not be so confused when they see me on a vehicle knowing I've been out all day and all night as to why I want to cancel a trip. And they should penalize me for that either. And that's one of the that's things. a good point. That is a good point, right? <laughs> yeah. I make all kinds of good points, but it's unfortunate and sad that people don't think that when you're disabled, you also have a life and a job and a boyfriend and friends. And like, I'm 33. I'm not 103. And if I was 103, I'd still have a life. Still go out. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's one of the things that I always tell people that being disabled has not changed my life. I'm still paying my bills, still paying my rent. Don't want to use my college education. And there's nothing wrong with having us be able to do it more freely. And the curve back has been awesome. It's been great, except it needs a lot of work. Because I don't know where y'all get these drivers, but it's, yeah. So I can go on and on, but I'll leave it at that. So I need, need work. So. <laughs> Those stories are really powerful and they're just a fragment of everything that happens out there. Um, so, 
after the panel, and after the panel, it was Sarah Kula says this question and answer. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about ARG's goals. First and foremost is to hear from the AAR users. You are important. Your voice is important. So we want to hear your stories, and we want to deliver it to MTA, and we want you to be leaders and deliver it yourself. We're out there to educate you so you become empowered and can speak for yourself and not rely on us all the time, because part of our belief is people should speak for themselves. Um, we really hope and plan to develop these leaders throughout the city. And we want them to go out and educate other people that they hear, like Iman said, on the way there. We're not going to be able to reach everybody by far. We're not going to be able to reach everybody. But empowering others is what this is really going to be So again, gathering stories is crucial to us. Hearing the problems is crucial. And we've actually established a relationship with the NTA AR, where we share these stories. So it's really an exciting opportunity. And I'm really happy to be honest with you. So what we like now is to have Shane Anderson, he's our AAR community organizer, come and discuss some of our accomplishments. Just a few minutes. Thank you. Everybody hear me good? Great. So my name is Shane Anderson. I'm the, as I just introduced, Accessorite Community Organizer for Sydney Center for New Medicine Disabled New York. So as Luda just said, we've had a, a number of really good accomplishments, and that's because we've had hundreds of people that have joined us in advocating for change with Accessorite. We've had hundreds of people that have told us their stories in person and over the phone. And we've took, taken those stories to the MTA. And some of the successes that we've had with that is earlier this year, the MTA planned on increasing the subway fare from 275. And we had users and their families and advocates come out and tell the MTA what that would mean. That would be raising the fare on the backs of people that can least afford it. And we've all heard about the quality of accessorized service. So the MTA got the message and the base fare is still 275. That's a win, that's a win for New York, and that's a win for accessorized users. Another story that we've heard, all right, is we had a woman that she was, she's a wheelchair user, and she had to hang on physically you know, on her, in her accessorized vehicle because the driver said repeatedly, oh, we can't strap you in correctly. So we took that story to Accessorite, and as been mentioned, they're going to be training their employees and their drivers so that the riders can be safe, people with disabilities can be safe in Accessorite vehicles, and their rights can be respected. Obviously more work to be done, but that's a very positive thing. Another thing that we're doing in terms of Accessorite, all right, is, as has been mentioned before, the on-demand pilot. That's huge. And that, again, is because hundreds of users came out with us and advocated for that change. They told the MTA, and we told the MTA, stories of people that have missed appointments and missed their obligations. Just one story that I'll share. For example, we had a woman who was, uh, she had a job interview. Really, really excited about it, okay? So she, as she's supposed to, she, uh, she booked that trip two days in advance. She, she waited. Time of her trip came. No excess ride. She said, oh, it's, it'll, it'll be there, it'll be there. She waited some more. No excess ride. Long story short, she missed that appointment because excess ride is unreliable. And as been previously mentioned, you don't have access to transportation that affects, affects your access to job jobs, healthcare, things like this, okay? So again, Accessorite heard that and is gonna do the on-demand pilot. 
That's huge. Another thing that we're doing in terms of accessory is we're, we're reaching out, okay? And they're talking to us, and we're talking to them, and they're saying, you know what? How can we help you? What's, what's some of the issues? And so we're, we're helping users apply for accessory, and we're helping users uh, deal with problems with accessory in terms of applications, in terms of appeals. So we have had great successes uh, with, this, with this project, and we hope to have more successes in the future. Thank you. I want to thank everybody who's already spoken. I think that you already have a flavor of why I wanted to have this town hall meeting. It gives us an opportunity for the MTA to present their plans to go forward. It gives the advocates and the riders an opportunity both to highlight the work that they're doing to help educate the MTA as to what's actually needed. Um, and also, I hope that growing out of this, we're going to see more ongoing communication where, shockingly, the MTA and Accessorize and Paratransit and riders and advocates could all feel comfortable talking to each other about what's going on, what's not working, and how we can make it better. Because I think that's probably everybody's goal. Um, so we have a panel of experts, and what I'm going to do, if it's okay, is just throw out some questions and let people respond, let people go back and forth. They're allowed to have different opinions, which is also just fine with me. Um, I'm going to ask each panelist to present their name and organization because I already messed up everybody's name. So, <laughs> Stephen Lopiano. We know already because we heard from him. Sir, even though I know you. Yes. <laughs> Joe Rapport. I'm from the Brooklyn Center for Independence of the Disabled. I'm Daniel Ross. I'm a staff attorney at Mobilization for Justice, formerly MFI Legal Services. The mics are not working. You know what? The only mic in this room is this one, right? You can pass it. So I'm going to put it on the table because I have a nice loud voice. And I will put it sort of in the middle and people, when they want to speak, can just grab it. How's that? All right. Iman Ramawi from the New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. So thank you, everyone. So let's start with sort of technical operational issues. And Stephen, you already presented on quite a bit of the changes. So Joe, what do you think <laughs> will be the biggest impact from all the different proposals that you've heard tonight and discussions that you as advocates have been having with the um, power transit world? Thanks so much uh, for that question. and. Um, you know, I think there are a few things that are uh, really vital, but uh, clearly the on-demand service is uh, has the potential to completely remake Accessori for people who use it. Uh, if you're, you know, many people in New York who do not use Accessori can go outside, grab a cab, or take a bus, or go into the subways whenever they want. We have a 24-hour system, and we will continue to have one in spite of uh, a recent proposal. Um, we have buses that typically uh, serve the city all the time, taxis, Accessoride does serve the city all the time, but you don't get a choice about when you take it, because you have to uh, reserve a day in advance. So. The program, it only has 200 people so far, but the program that Steve talks is talking about, the on-demand service, could really remake yep. Accessori and really make a remake, uh, make it easier for people to uh, get around who need it. Right now in New York, the, un I'm sorry, the employment rate for people with disabilities is about 29%. And after discrimination, mm -hmm. transportation is cited as the reason that people can't get jobs or can't keep them. 
I'm the boss that said Valerie could stay home and work that day, but a lot of bosses can't do that or won't do that. So we need a reliable system that gets people where they want and allows them to go where they want, when they want to go. And certainly based on the stories that the three people told in their lives, um, an e hail rollout option should, sounds like it should offer real improvement. So Steve, how, what's the timeline for really getting us to an on-demand service for all people? Okay, so as I mentioned before, we're currently doing this on a, uh, a trial basis with 100 customers utilizing the Curb app and 100 customers utilizing the Curb app but not on smartphones calling in accessorized when they want to travel. Uh, we've also asked customers through an MTA press release, I don't know if anybody's seen it, that if they would like to participate in an on in, in, as we expand the on-demand pilot to let us know, give us your information, tell us which option that you would prefer to use for on-demand travel and as we expand it we will draw more people into the program from that list. Right now we want to be very cautious that this type of service is is right for our customers. I think it, it, it provides many new options that many of our customers are going to appreciate. However, you know, one of the problems is taxi drivers, Uber drivers. All right, so we're working on a program with the Taxi and Limousine Commission to develop a training course for taxi drivers that are going to be dealing with Accessoride customers. They've told us that they will administer their, this course through their ongoing relationship with drivers when they have to renew or when new drivers come into the system, and that's positive. So in terms of time frame, which is really answering the, the Senator's question, we hope to add more people to the, to the 200 that we currently have as soon as we do some testing with the customers that are in that, and that'll involve focus groups as well as surveys. We hope to do, during the course of the pilot, at least 600,000 trips. It could go as many as a million two hundred thousand trips, but we want to get at least 600,000 trips completed. At that point, which would take us somewhere into maybe the, the first quarter or, or, or a little bit closer to the first half of 2018, I think we should have enough information to make a decision as to how this program fits into the paratransit operation. We will then contract with these, with these companies that have performed well as part of the pilot, and we will open it up to all our customers to use this new type of service. So middle of 2018, I think, is when it becomes available to anybody who would want to travel that way. Right, I was just going to ask that. If you want to be a beta tester guinea pig in this, mm -hmm. how do you sign up? Okay, so you call Accessorize. And you, I think it's eight, right? Option eight. Option eight, and that's the comment line. And you tell them that you would like to participate in the on-demand pilot, and they will take down your information, and they will include you in the list that we're currently compiling. And I heard somebody say it might be after wait for for option eight. If you're having a problem, contact my office. We'll take your information and get it. To accessorize, okay? Yeah, I've been sharing the link for that press release all over the place. So you can take Maybe my that's card. why I have to wait because everybody's rushing to try. <laughs> well, actually, we haven't gotten a great response. So oh. I, I would encourage it. everybody yeah. that would want to do this to call us. Let us get you on the list because that's the way we're going to roll it out to additional customers. Okay. Um, one of the, um, I'm sorry, I think. Shane, when he was talking, talked about the victory of keeping prices somewhat lower. The MTA is also talking about rolling out a new metro card system. Is it possible that the new metro card might be built into the accessorite system so, or, or the e-cal system so that we're all working off of one um, piece of Okay, so what, what they call it in the MTA is the new fair payment system, the NFPS. And yes, I know in the past that when they rolled out the Metro card, there were no card readers on the accessorized vehicle. There will be 
and it's not going to be a card reader, it's going to be some type of passive reader, will be on the accessorized vehicles as part of the rollout for the new fare payment system. As, part, as far as getting that technology into taxis and black cars, it's a little bit more difficult. The accessorized vehicles we own, all right, so we could install whatever we want in those vehicles. We don't own the black cars, we don't own the taxis. It's something that we are keeping as an option. So part of what we're looking at is first installing it in the accessorized vehicles and then looking at open loop options for these cards so that maybe they can interface with the credit card systems that are currently in these vehicles and allow our customers to pay the fare that way. I'm going to jump to Daniel and legal issues if that's okay. I'm just jumping around. So sometimes at my office we get calls from people saying, they believe they're eligible, but they got rejected. And so I want some help from you to understand how do you figure out what the correct eligibility criteria is and what do you do if you think that you have not been evaluated correctly? That's a great question. I'm, uh, on the table by the sign-in sheet, I, I left some fact sheets, one about applying and, and one designed for doctors. Uh, with some tips that we've learned over the years about what makes a good doctor's letter so that the customer has the information that it's looking for, which may not be in the, in the application that we see when people, when we get calls like that, people say, I gave them everything they could have wanted. Why did they reject me? And while they gave them a lot of stuff, they didn't give them what a MTA was looking for. Um, and so hopefully that will be helpful. But basically to qualify for accessory, your disability needs to prevent you from using buses and subways. And so, you know, that could mean uh, you're a wheelchair user and there's no elevator at, at the stop by your home. It could mean that um, you have uh, PTSD from a, a, an accident on a bus. Um, and so actually climbing onto the bus uh, triggers that PTSD and, and you just physically can't be in that space. Or you may have some, some anxiety about being in a, in a cramped and confined setting that you can't get off of and that you can't get your feet on. Um, if, there's, if you have a disability, whether it's psychological or, or physical or sensory, uh, if it prevents you from being in that space or getting to that space, uh, you would qualify for accessory. And so we have some fact sheets, as I mentioned, but you can also call us. I imagine most people here already have accessorized, so this isn't the problem that you're facing, but if it is, um, you can take a fact sheet or, or give us a call and, and we'd be happy to, to work with you and, and give you some advice. And follow, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, right, I'm, I'm sorry. So, so Joe, Joe made a good point, which is that some people qualify in limited ways, right? Maybe most of the time they can take the bus, um, but they can't take the bus if they have to walk more than five blocks. If, if where they're going isn't within five blocks of a of a bus stop, then they really can't get there. It's too far for them to walk. Um, or if it's really, really cold, and they might have a, a circulatory condition that prevents them from being in the cold for too long. Most of the time they can take the bus, but they can't wait for the bus in the winter when it's too cold. And so there are these conditions that could also apply to your trip and to your, to your eligibility. And if you've been denied when you apply, at least somebody has raised with me that the appeal is just internal to <laughs> the process. Is there other models that we should be looking at so that people feel like, that they didn't just get the same answer from a different person at the same age. Right. So, and we we brought a lawsuit a, a couple years ago now against Accessorize for what we saw as due process violations. You know, we, we do a lot of public benefits work at MFY, Public Vision for Justice, and um, you know, there's a, a right to an opportunity to be heard, um, and where you get to present your case, and you get to present your case before they cut off your benefits. And so we've come to a settlement that I think is being implemented quite well, um, where when you get that initial denial letter, um, 
it used to be just a form letter that you would get, and it would list eight things about what accessorized things are the skills you need to be able to use uh, buses and subways. And we would get calls from people all the time, because they would see this list and they would say, yeah, I don't have any problem walking, and I don't have any problem um, you know, climbing the stairs to the bus, but I can't be on the bus. I'm, I, my anxiety makes it impossible for me to be on the bus. Um, and so they're getting this form letter, and, and it's talking about steps and talking about walking, and, and that's not speaking to them. And so now, if you get denied accessorized, you get that form letter, a slightly revised form letter, but you also get a page that's specific to your case, and it'll say why the accessorized uh, decision makers made that decision. So it'll say, um, applicant was able to climb the stairs, uh, the psychiatric, the psychologist evaluation indicated that the person could take the bus. Um, and and the, rather, the applicant may disagree with that assessment, but at least now they know what in the application wasn't right, what, what accessor I saw wasn't right. And so you can actually request your whole file, too. So you can see not just that paragraph or so, but you can see all of the papers that the assessor filled out. You know, did they write down something incorrectly so that when the decision was made, they were basing it on, on misinformation? Um, did they not find one of the doctor's letters helpful so that you could go back to that doctor and get a, a more useful letter? Um, those kinds of things. And then it's pretty common for the first round of appeals for a, a public benefit to be internal. Um, and so I don't think that necessarily needs to be reconsidered. Um, but hopefully with this more information, it gives applicants a, a way where they think they actually, when they go back for the appeal, it will be a bit different. Um, and then if, if it's not different and, and the person does get denied uh, in the appeal, it used to just say, you can reapply, you're not getting accessorized, uh, or you're not getting accessorized, but you can reapply if you think you made a, uh, a mistake. It now tells people that they do have another option that they can reapply, and that might honestly be the fastest way for them to be reevaluated and to get services, but that they can also go to court. Um, the Accessorized Appeals Board's final decision is a final agency decision, and, and like any other final agency decision in New York State, if it's a, a government agency, that can be brought to court in an Article 78 proceeding, um, where you challenge that decision, and it goes before a Supreme Court judge. And and so that's a lot of work, and it can be a slow process. So it may not be the, the best decision for, for everyone, but it, but it is an option. Thank you. All right, we're going to jump to Iman on the writer's perspective. We heard from you and two other writers already. already. Mm -hmm. So we've all heard about the paratransit's new proposals and the rollout and the option. What do you think? I guess one from your perspective, what do you think will be um, most important to writers? And what do we need to make sure writers know or learn or can get help with so they can take advantage of the new program? Right. Um, so the, the curb app started uh, November 29th. And I was so excited I couldn't even sleep the night before. And I, you know, went on because they said it was going to start at midnight and I went on to check the app to make sure it was working and then I was like oh snap it is working I'm so excited but then the next day when I was actually going to work use it to go to the office the app wouldn't work right and then I'm like what's the point of this app if it's not going to work right and I had to call the, the operator folks and they had no idea how to fix this and then apparently Curve and Accessori, even though they're working on the same system, they have two different systems. So they don't even know if I'm getting a car sent to my, my house and I'm in a car already, even though I'm booking it through the same thing. So I found that all out on the first day, so that was awesome. And the second day I was also excited because I was like, okay, great, I can, I'm going to go do a, a, a panel on Queens and I'm in Frogs Tech, not so far, it's not so bad. Um, but it kept canceling me. The curb app kept canceling my trip, and it canceled it like five times, and then it canceled me while I was in the cab on my way to the panel, so that was super 
super fun. Um, and then I had to pay for it because it was canceled. But then Verifone called me back and refunded it because it was 60 bucks, and I wasn't expecting to pay 60 bucks. Um, and so, you know, to go, go around and then it, they have to, Curb and Accessoride are partners to this whole pilot program. And so there has to be clear guidelines to this partnership. And they have to actually work together. And so if that means using the same system, telling your operators, some of these accessory operators have no idea that the curb app is any time. And I've had a bunch of them say, oh, you can't book a trip after five. It's like, yeah, no, actually, I can. I don't know why you guys don't know this. And then the regular accessory operators on the regular number have no idea this curb app is even going on. So they're like, wait a minute, that's actually happening? I'm like, yes, it is actually. Here, do you want the number? You can call them yourself. I'm not making this up. Um, and granted, it's been, what, it's the 14th of it's been like 15 days it's been going on. And so it's going to need time. But it has been, I was so excited the first time, I was like, I should just go to Target, get some groceries, because I didn't know where to go. But I just went down the block from the office, chilled out for a minute, and then was able to leave whenever I wanted to leave. And I, I felt like, I felt like since I've been using Accessorize, uh, in some hands, it's gotten better since now you get automated calls, now you get emails, and that's new. That didn't used to happen before. Um, but there are other things that do need improvement, like not being on a trip for five hours, um, not getting an entire tour of the... I, I can't tell you how many times I have seen some neighborhoods that I've never seen before. Or <laughs> And I've lived in New York my entire life. I'm a yeah. Queens girl. I've lived in every single borough, even Staten Island. And, you know, do I, but do I want to go back to Staten Island sometimes? No. I've got not, no reason to be there. I don't need to be there, but I have gone there. And, you know, it's, I, so yeah, so I mean, it just, there has to be a, there ha, like this morning, I waited an hour to get picked up. Even though I was like, well, let me just look at the night before. And then in the morning, they couldn't find a, a, a cab. And I'm like, but I booked it the night before. So what? And I got to the office an hour late. And then even coming over here, it was an hour and 20 minutes. So, and Stephen, I'm going to pray. Yeah, you. sorry. I know. No, 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 it's good. You know, I was just saying, so you're telling some stories of the dangers of being the beta testing guinea oh, yeah. pig who's trying it, the lithium that goes on. So, Stephen, one, are you tracking these new problems since you've rolled out, and is there are you working to make sure these problems are resolved? How? Uh, absolutely. We look at every single trip every day. We meet with Verifone, which is the provider, once a week. We go through these problems, and you're right. There are there have been problems with the rollout. We knew there were going to be problems, and that's why you do a pilot, and that's why you do a small pilot so that. Unfortunately, those that are participating in, in the pilot right now are taking the brunt of this, but if we can get the kinks out of the system, we're not doing it with a thousand people where you know it would cause a lot more uh, concern to our customers. So we're meeting with our phone on a weekly basis. We're working out the problems, and a couple of the problems that we saw immediately is, and, and we, we kind of knew this was going to be a problem, is that to book an accessible vehicle and one of the outer boroughs on demand is going to be difficult. And, and the, the reason that is, is because there's not enough vehicles out there. To do on demand travel, you need a lot of capacity. All right, that's why Uber works so well, because they got 20,000 vehicles out there. And no matter where you are, any time of day, there's usually somebody that's pretty close to you. All right? The green taxis in the outer boroughs, it's not the same thing. Manhattan works much better because you do have that density and you do have that capacity. But once you start booking out uh, book, uh, trips in the outer boroughs, it be, it's going to become more problematic. And I really don't have a solution for that now. The solution is more accessible taxis in the outer boroughs. The uh, Taxi and Limousine Commission is working on that when they add uh, the four higher vehicles to the mix. I think that'll help a lot. We're also going to use our leverage as the MTA to push
companies like Uber and Lyft that want to do business with us to become more accessible. It's going to be a condition of, of, of being a partner with the MTA on paratransit. So hopefully through efforts of, 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 the, of, the, uh, of the coalition group and other uh, advocates for uh, people who use paratransit, we can use our combined muscles to try to get more vehicles out there because that really is going to represent the future of on-demand travel. All right. Thank you. So I'm sort of rolling in questions that came in from the cards to the different people, um, but following up on, I think, both your question and your point and your answer, um, tying into other people's concerns. So, ETL is supposed to work borough to borough, not just internal to borough, right? right? And you're supposed to be able to... No, 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 no. no. they tell no, us no, just no, it's, it's, it's in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. it's, it will not take you out of Manhattan right. if you're Manhattan. Anybody else know? Because you think they are supposed to. Yeah. Supposed to uh, on the Curb app that we're currently doing the on-demand pilot, you should be able to travel anywhere you want as long as we can locate a vehicle to take you there. The, the problem where you're not able to make those trips is because on some of the apps it's sometimes during the day there's low driver acceptance of the trip. So the trip goes out on the system, but what needs to happen next is a driver who's close to the pickup point needs to say, I accept that trip. Mm -hmm. okay. So we're getting low cut, we're, we're getting low driver acceptance, and, and that's something that we're working on with Verifone. When we add the other taxi company, CMT, to our pilot, that's going to increase the number of cabs that are out there, that'll improve the acceptance rate, and as we add even more providers, the fact of, uh, of our customers being able to book a trip and, and actually get a trip is should increase dramatically. But e now does not go out of Manhattan if you're in Manhattan. Right. No, it doesn't. It should. No, it, it does not. No, it, it does, does not. not. Okay, so Stephen's going to take that back and get well, back. Ken, you want to answer that question? Sure, I can just interject the, the, uh, on the on-demand pilot that is between boroughs, but it is also true that if you're making a reservation one or two days in advance and you're offered uh, e hail it is just within the borough at the current time. But mm -hmm. the on-demand uh, will allow between boroughs as well, and as it's expanded, it will probably continue to be between boroughs as well. So there's, there's two ways we currently use e hail One is this on-demand pilot. And the other is as a way of replacing the taxi authorization. So instead of giving you a taxi authorization, we book the trip for you through e -hail. It should be rolling out to all boroughs, and I will fix that when I get back to paratransit. There's no reason that it shouldn't be in the borough. And is paratransit going to continue to have four free rides a day for people who can use bus or subway, as you currently do? On the zero fare metro card, you'll continue to get your four trips per day. Okay. And can you tell us what that is, Liz? Can you explain that, Stephen? Okay. Any customer that is eligible for paratransit can also apply for a zero fare metro card, which means that if you tell us you want this card, we will send it to you, and you can take up to four trips without paying any fare on the bus or subway per day. So the example that, that I have heard was, um, so you could get a paratransit trip to an accessible subway stop, then you might choose to take the subway, assuming the accessible subway stop is actually accessible that day, and that's another meeting for another night. Um, so you could then take the subway Interborough, which might cut some of your five hour wait, yeah. well, five hour trip. Um, and then, so it allows you to combine the use of the bus and subway system with accessory right now. Obviously, for some people, that's never an option, but for some people, it actually can be a useful option. Okay, everybody yeah. gets that? And you're not taking that proposal away. Sorry, I just need to put my flashlight on to read the cards. I have a comment about the, because I use e a lot, which I think is terrific. But 
But today I booked it to come here, and I booked it for 5 o'clock uh, on the Upper West Side. So they wrote me back 7.30, um, they were getting picked up at 4.05, and I didn't look at it until 2.30 in the morning, and I said, what is this? This is a mistake. So I call up, and the guy said, you have to call in the morning at uh, 7 o'clock. So I, at 7 o'clock I called in the morning, and she said, well, we're calling this an open issue. So then at 2 o'clock I called to see what the story is, and they said the open issue was canceled. So nobody got back to me. But you know, it's the idea, if I knew that, the 405, I would have had a taxi authorization. I realized in New York City, around 5 o'clock, the drivers change. Yes. And that could possibly we be why. Three, but you know, yeah. I've never had that before. Paratrips have brought me here. So I was really, you know, taken aback. I figured, oh, there's a mistake somewhere. And, but the idea, when you call somebody to correct it or change it, oh, I can't do anything. You know, the, like, I'll call it an open issue. You go to someone else. No, we review it two hours later. <coughs> no one gets back to you. It's part of that stuff that they don't get back to you. You know, no, what, what's going on? Because I would have said, you know, say to me, said, give me a taxi organization. Well, that's one thing we want to try to do. It's so, the questions if there's time. I, I appreciate yes. your comments. And no, we'll what we will do yeah, is we'll take that up with our phone because you're absolutely right. They're supposed to get back to you. Tell you that your trip is confirmed, or that there might be an issue with that trip. You know, in case you want to book, you know, uh, an alternative travel option. They sent me an email at 7:30. I didn't hear it. Interview at 2:30. The other thing I have to tell you, because I you know what, I'm going to cut you off because we're not doing it this way, okay? And I let you. But I want to. I want to. No, ma'am. I'm sorry. There's we've got like five questions up there. We're not going to necessarily use everybody's examples. But but one of the points you did make was an issue that I actually come up several times tonight about, what is this open and then cancel concept? Who's, who opens or keeps the, I feel like I'm saying it's a case, but it's supposed to be a uh, reservation. So what does a reservation become open and then who has the authority to close it? When, That's lingo I don't understand. Yeah, well, it's lingo I really don't understand either, so I'm gonna have to get into that with Verifone. What, I think what they're referring to is, is, is if it's an advanced reservation trip, what they do is they work directly with the taxi bases to try to get that trip covered. And if they cover the trip, then it becomes a trip that is, is, is booked and ready to happen. However, what happens sometimes on the day of service, when they go to uh, make sure that the driver is going to pull out and take that trip, something happens and the vehicle is no longer available. So then it becomes, I think, what you're calling an open trip. They don't have it covered. But it's their responsibility to cover those trips. And if there is a problem with the trip, they're supposed to let you know, they're supposed to let us know, so, we, so that we can make alternative travel arrangements for you. For you. And, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that it happened, but I will certainly work with Parafon to make sure that it does it again. Joe, can I just say one thing to that? Uh, let me no, it, it, let him answer. Yeah, sorry. Oh. I just wanted to say one thing. One of the, uh, uh, Steve made a reference to the need for more wheelchair accessible uh, vehicles, especially in the outer boroughs. Um, and and there's been a lot of talk about the damage that Uber and Lyft have done to the LO taxi industry. So. One of the things that uh, we are very keen on is uh, getting more accessible, not everybody needs an accessible vehicle, I realize that, but getting more of these vehicles and getting yellow tabs, uh, we use the Curb app into the program and understanding that this is a way of uh, getting regular business because they complain. They don't get as many rides as they used to. They have competition. Now Uber may ultimately become uh, part of this uh, uh, on-demand service as well, um, and they did do some testing with Uber uh, previously, but this is a real opportunity for uh, the yellow medallions and for the uh, other four higher vehicles in the outer boroughs um, to really increase business, have a regular stream of, of income. My group in Sydney had been a part of the Taxi for All campaign, which pushed for accessible yellow cabs and pushed for the rule that was passed yesterday by the Taxi Limousine Commission. So um, there's a lot of moving parts here, but 
there are real opportunities for the yellow cabs and for the for hire vehicle industry for these companies. And um, you know, we think that what the MTA do, is doing, even though obviously there are some flaws as the program begins, has the opportunity to really change uh, not only transportation for people who use paratransit, but for these companies. What happened yesterday? Yeah, so uh, there was a reference to um, the Taxi and Limousine Commission. What it did, didn't get much coverage, but what it did is passed a rule that requires uh, Uber and your local car services and anybody, 666, you know, 666 with those yeah, no. inane ads, yes. um, uh, they all are required now uh, by virtue of this rule. It, it, it kicks in in several months, but they are required to start offering some accessible service. Um, Uber and Lyft and some of these companies came forward and said, we don't want to do what the taxi and limousine a rule would require, and we have our own plan, and they got approval to do a pilot as well. We objected to that. We're pretty skeptical about whether it will work. But the, in both cases, whether it's the pilot that Uber is putting forward or this rule that the Taxi and Limousine Commission has, what we'll see over a few year period is an increase in the number of wheelchair accessible um, taxis on the road, not just taxis, but car services and so on. It's not a perfect rule. It has a, a lot that needs to be improved, but um, groups like ours are going to keep pushing uh, to make it work. And I, with the, at the MTA, uh, at, at New York City Transit, uh, where Accessoride realizes that if there are more wheelchair accessible cabs on the road, uh, their on-demand service can work uh, much better. If you're in the outer boroughs and you're trying to get an accessible cab, especially if you're, say, coming to work, um, it's really, really hard. So the idea is to increase the number of accessible cabs, increase the number of people, of, of companies that are participating in the MTA program, and ultimately, again, as I've said several times, and other people have said, ultimately make this work so that everybody has the same kind of service that everybody else has in the city. And let me just highlight that from the questions I'm getting, a good half of them relate to the need for more accessible um, cabs for people who have wheelchairs and other equipment, and the, the greater problem of trying to go to and from outer boroughs. Which now I can't run for mayor because you can't say outer boroughs and run for mayor. That's right. I have to say <laughs> other boroughs. But I'm not running for mayor. So <laughs> because apparently I can't pronounce people's names, and I said it. Um, and I almost said when you were describing Staten Island, then seriously, why would you want to go there? But I was destroying my entire political future right here tonight. At the World Sinai Center at Union Square. Remember it later, and Brad, we're taping it. So yeah, we are taping it. It's going to be online, so everybody can see it. it. <laughs> but no, seriously, the questions are very consistent about the frustrations. And again, as Joe just pointed out, and, and Stephen also, there are things that are within MTA and paratransit's control, and then are, there are things that are bigger than them, which is trying to make sure we have more accessible cabs, um, that we, although we can try to continue to push that, if you have accessible cabs, you're the kind of company we want to do business with, and if you don't actually have them on the road, then no, not so much. Um, but I also have some questions, I know I have many questions. Um, around seniors issues. So if you're accessorized but you're also a senior, are you allowed to have a half fare? What's the rule? Sure. You, sure. If, if you're an accessorized customer, you can have a, a, a half fare metro card, or you can have a zero fare metro card also that you could use it on the bus and subways. But no, you do not get to use the half fare on accessory. Uh, you have to pay the two cents. That was what I was trying to ask. Yeah. Okay. Why not? Well, I don't really have a good answer for that. <laughs> it's a tariff issue that is dealt with by the MTA board, and they would have to change the fair tariff policy in order to amend that. Uh, it's something that uh, 
if people are really interested in seeing that happen, push for it. You know, and, and, and let's see what happens. It's killing me. Okay. Come, come to the FDA board meeting. Right. So the, another what? challenge for us to deal with with the MTA board. Yeah. Um, apparently is the answer. Now, what if you're somebody who needs multiple assistants or family members to help you get from one place to another? How many are you allowed to have with you? Okay, so every, every customer is allowed to travel with a personal care attendant that rides free, okay, after you pay 275. And we will book guests up to the capacity limit in the vehicle that you're traveling. So if you want to travel with four guests and we have the capacity in that vehicle, which means that we don't have other customers booked into it at the same time, we will accommodate you. The guests, however, must pay the $2.75 transit fare. So there's already a complaint even in the whole new system that the reservationists who are using the computers, the schedule, um, it's just too slow to place a reservation and that the boxes are too complicated I guess when you're trying to look on the drop down menu on the, I guess the app is what we're talking about. No, that's the regular computer. The regular computer, okay. Mm -hmm. But you don't use the computer, somebody. The reservationist yeah. does, and they say, oh, please wait, I'm waiting for my uh, computer, it's slow today. Okay. So today we learned that the state and city housing departments were using computers that dated back to 1989 in the DOS space. How bad are you? Actually, our computers aren't that old. They're, they're systems-based computers, okay? So they're fairly new, and, but they're not the issue. The issue is the system. Yes. It, it works slowly. It's a 12-year-old it's a system. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that makes access, uh, you know, accessorize difficult in terms of the speed that it operates in and I, many people have mentioned, why do I get a long ride when I book my trip? Is because if the current system for booking trips relies on an engine that as p people are calling in and making reservations two days in advance, the computer is booking those trips and making schedules at the same time. All right, so we never really have all the, all, all the trips in hand for the schedules that we're gonna run the next day until five o'clock when, when accessorite closes. That gives us a very limited amount of time to try to find these anomalies before we put out the schedules because we basically have to send them to the carriers by four o'clock in the morning so the drivers have the schedules that they can operate. We are replacing this system. As I said before, we have an RFP on the street. We hope to have it completely replaced by the end of 2018. It uses a completely <coughs> different logic to build schedules. In fact, it will continuously optimize schedules as people are calling in and booking trips so that at the end of the day, when we send those schedules to our carriers, they will be much more efficient, all right? It will try to force all the trips into a schedule, which destroys our time performance. It'll take those trips that cannot be scheduled efficiently, put them on the side, and we'll find different ways of booking those trips, either utilizing brokers, either uh, utilizing e -hail, or if necessary, opening up brand new schedules on the dedicated carriers to accommodate those trips, because we're not going to force them into the existing trips and kill the on-time performance. So I think this is going to be a revolutionary change in the way we build trips, and I think you're going to see it in terms of your experience when you're traveling on Accessoride that these three or four hour trips aren't going to happen because of the scheduling building process. They still may happen if your vehicle breaks down and we have difficulty replacing it, but the schedules as they go out will be much more efficient. Um, sure. Yeah, my, I mean, I've, we've talked uh, uh, over the last month or so uh, about trying to come up with ways before you, you know, put in this new system in a, in a, a year's time to reduce uh, some of these very long trips and, and uh, the Pat Foy, uh, there's a, I'm not sure of his title at the MTA. President. Uh, president, okay, there you have it. Uh, uh, you know, 
uh, indicated that he was interested in, in trying to see how this could be done more quickly, in other words, not waiting for another year, because, you know, if you multiply the number of hours that people are, uh, you know, sitting on vehicles times, it, you know, it's a lot of wasted time, it's a lot of economic opportunities lost. So I was wondering if you have looked at that since that discussion and come up with some ideas about how to reduce uh, these shared rides and these out of work, these borough tours as people were talking about. Yeah, there's a couple of things we're doing. What we're doing is we're adjusting the schedules, all right? And, and one of the problems that we have with our schedules is we can't simulate with the engine that we have now, the scheduling engine, we can't simulate what the results are going to be. So it's trial and error, all right? The new engine will have simulators on it, so we'll be able to simulate the results. But in this particular scheduling engine, we try something, then we have to wait, get the results, look at it, fine tune it a little bit more. And we've been doing this consistently. Uh, we've brought the on-time performance up to 95% in October as a result of making these minor changes from what used to be in 2015 about 90%. So that's, that's a significant improvement. In terms of the ride times, we've been a little less successful. However, one of the programs that I mentioned before in my presentation is that we're telling all our carriers that when they encounter trips, that they deem, because they have dispatchers out in the field that are supposed to be looking at these trips as they unfold during the day, if they identify trips that could result in a no-show or a significant delay for our customers, turn those back into us, all right? And we will rebook them in a different way. And so far, that has worked pretty good also. Uh, the engine is the ultimate solution to, to this problem. However, we're going to continue to look for what we can do in the short term to help alleviate some of these problems. Uh, I can't guarantee that they're all going to go away, but we're going to keep making adjustments where we can. And, you know, so far we've had some limited success, and I think as we move forward we'll even have some additional success. So a number of questions tie into the staff not knowing or understanding the authorization authorization for taxi rule and even not allowing people to get an authorization because quote they've used it too many times a month but no one can explain what too many means and then another question relating was when you get the paper trail finally sent to you it doesn't actually lay out what the trip was at what date so that you can reconcile and keep track of any of these stories for yourself. So is there a better way to do all this and are we working on this? Yeah, taxi authorizations are a problem for a lot of reasons. Uh, it's a program that uh, requires our customers to wait to be reimbursed. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, uh, it's a problem for us because it creates a lot of back office work in processing these. It's also a program that we've discovered a lot of fraud on, where other than our customers have been utilizing uh, the taxis, or somebody makes an arrangement with a car service company and uh, fraudulent receipts come into paratransit. So it, it, it's not a good solution, right? So we've been replacing that with eHale. Hopefully we intend to replace it all the way with eHale. However, in the meantime, if you want to use a taxi authorization because that works best for you, we're not eliminating the program. We're, because right now, we can't allow all our customers to travel when they want and where they want because the capacity that we have to uh, allow our customers to use the app and the call-in feature is limited. And a taxi authorization gives you that ability. We're allowing our customers to continue to use it, but hopefully when we have the Accessoride app constructed and available to our customers and we have made changes to our computer system where we can take a lot more call-in on-demand trip requests, we hope to be able to eliminate that program entirely. 
Last question, just because I'm looking at the clock and we promised to get everybody out of here closing 7.55, um, 7.54. So a number of questions about the accessorized van. And you did in your presentation early on, they talked about 400 new ones? 400 with an option for 300 to okay. follow immediately. And obviously we spent a lot of the time tonight talking about the new options for people who can use them that will probably decrease the number of people who have only the excessive ride van choices. But several people pointed out the ones you have aren't really designed right for the people who are using them. I mean, you've used the example of somebody before, sorry, Shane, you did, but they couldn't um, strap the person in correctly. Okay, when you were telling that story, I was just going, liability, <laughs> oh my God, lawsuits, lawsuits, don't do that. Um, but there, and then you gave the example of that preventing people have to be on for five hours. Our buses, you can plug in your phones now. No. What? Uh, bus on buses. Some you can. buses. Some buses. Some, Some buses. 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 Some one of the things that I mentioned before is that when we get this new GPS system in place, we're going to have screens on these vehicles. We'll be able to track your ride. Your drop location will be identified on the screen, and you'll be able to see a continuous ETA of when the vehicle is going to arrive there. On our new vehicles that we're purchasing, we're also going to be installing onboard cameras. Okay, so if there is an issue on board the vehicle involving the driver, and a customer or several customers will be able to go back and look at the video and see what the issue is and to verify that. So the new vehicles will be coming with cameras. Uh, one of the other things that we're looking at is customer amenity, uh, amenities, you know, that where uh, you might be able to plug in your cell phone and other options. And one of the big changes that we made in uh, Excessive Ride is we understand that we need to get new different types of vehicles into our fleet that provide you know better options for our customers. However, what what I find is because when we do this with our uh, our uh, paratransit advisory committee, is that it may be a good vehicle for you, but it doesn't. It's not a good vehicle for you. Uh, and that is one of the problems. So what we've, what we've developed is a new bus test program where rather than going out and buying vehicles and saying uh, to our customers, here it is, what we're going to do is we're going to buy vehicles on a test basis where people come to us and they want to show us new products and new designs for vehicles. We will lease those vehicles. We'll run them in service for six months. We'll ask our customers how they like those vehicles. And we'll use that as a basis for future purchases of accessorized vehicles. I want to thank everyone here tonight. We learned a lot. We didn't get all of our questions answered. I'm sorry. We don't have solutions for everybody. But I think we're seeing right here, live and in person, um, opportunities for real improvement in accessorized paratransit. And I do credit the fact that advocates have been continually going to Paratransit and the MTA and saying this is what we need. And I think we should give applause that they're hearing us. Maybe not as fast as we like, maybe not every answer, but the fact that we can have an open dialogue and we're seeing real improvements in real time, even though I would never try the app the first night. Just for the record, you are a great woman. <laughs> <laughs> I would never try the app the first night. I'm not yeah. the best yeah. So I want to thank everyone for their attendance tonight. Let's give our panel a big hand. And I know there are materials from some of the organizations, oh, right. including contact information, which I'm sure they'd love you to get involved with ARG. And, um, and the MTA has a table full yeah. of materials. And if you have questions that didn't get answered, don't be, feel free to call our office and or the organizations, and we will we will try to get your questions answered. Thank you, everyone.